So imagine a world where you can grow your own home. Now, some of you might be familiar with the work that's been done in the laboratory in the Netherlands where they're growing what they call cultured meat. Or you might also be aware of <coughs> the little bit of work that they're doing there on insect burgers. Mm. But did you know that you can apply that principle to the homes and the buildings that we live in with this brick? I bet you didn't. <laughs> now, what I want to say to you is we're living in a time of increased challenges. We have a population that is growing at an enormous rate, believe it or not. We have unprecedented wealth in the world on a global scale. And the UN says that maybe in 150 years' time, we could have 125 times the population we currently have. Now, just think about that. We're not very good at the moment at housing the people that we already have. I mean, I was walking in this morning and we were coming up by the canal and there was people there living in a tent. I mean, this is the 21st century and we're a so-called advanced country here. So, trying to face this challenge is quite a big one. And there are a couple of different schools of thought on this. Some people say that over time, man will innovate. He'll always innovate to solve whatever problem he faces and solve them with technology. Other people say, no, we've got to tighten our belts. We've got to cut back. I say that we can do both, and we can do both with this brick. Now, you may have remembered these incredible scenes from a couple of months ago in London when that tower block went on fire. And what some of you, obviously, I'm a, a building physics nerd, I kind of know about this. But what some of you may not realize is that one of the reasons why that fire was so bad and why it spread so rapidly was because insulation had been put on the building and it hadn't been taught through properly and it allowed the fire to spread. So actually, a project that was meant to improve the lives of people turned out to be uh, a bit of a disaster in some respects. So that's the scale of the challenge that we're facing. We have increased population. We have also a demand for increased standards. We want better homes. We want more energy efficient homes. We want more comfort. Everybody all over the world wants that. And some people think that this is the solution. A plastic Wendy house. Okay, so I am exaggerating a little bit. I mean, Wendy might insulate her house not quite as well as what engineers are proposing now. But I am serious. One of the main things we have in Europe now is a standard. It's a law, actually. It's called the Energy Performance and Buildings Directive. And what it says is that every country must set a minimum standard of energy performance for every new building. And you have to realize that those standards are very, very demanding. And a lot of people think that building what's called a passive house is the way to do it. And it's a brilliant design. There's no doubt about it. It's a concept where a series of equations works out what the energy demand of your home is. And you've got to figure out how to make your home to that series of equations. However, things can go wrong. Because now what you're doing is you're literally wrapping your home in a plastic bag. And we all know that if you do that and you don't ventilate it properly, then you get magic mushrooms. Okay? Try it sometime. <coughs> Trust me. So I want to talk to you a little bit about hempcrete and why I think it could be the solution. So. First of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. It's a material that is made from the inner core, uh, which is also called the shiv, of the hemp plant. And it's the industrial hemp variety, not the other stuff. It does look kind of the same, right? That I'll, I'll give you that. And for years, people in the plastics industry were able to get the cultivation of this very severely restricted in the USA. 
but it's making a huge comeback, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that presently. But first I want to tell you that homes that are built using natural materials, like this cave home here in Spain, keeps you cool inside even when it's 40 degrees outside. Or maybe this home here in Germany is a type of a passive house. It has lots of windows, and the bricks were made locally, right? This type of science is how we always used to build. For example, this is my grandfather's home. I visited there about two or three weeks ago. I was amazed to find that it was an earth house. I mean, it, that never occurred to me before. Of course it was. It was built maybe 150 years ago. And it's still standing, and it's still as dry as a bone. So what are the advantages of this? Well, number one, it's completely sustainable. You can literally grow it in your garden. Um, it's one of the fastest growing plants in the world. It requires very little um, fertilizer inputs. Also, it makes a very light but thermally insulating material. We add a little bit of lime to it, but we can also add clay. We can add a little bit of uh, cement as well if we wanted to get it to set quicker. And in our work here, we decided to make bricks because one of the limitations with working with lime is that it's very hard to get it to set when it's below minus five degrees, or sorry, five degrees. So we figured that if we could make bricks in advance, people, if we told people how to do that, and we standardized the whole process, people could literally build, grow, and develop their own home while they were sleeping. Now, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about why I decided to follow this road and how I came to follow what I'm calling this yellow brick road. You'll pardon my pun. So a number of years ago, I was an IT consultant. Uh, it was probably 15, 20 years ago. I, see, I, I'm trying to pretend I don't remember. Um, <laughs> And a friend of mine said to me, you know, he was living, he had a family home down in the west of Ireland. He said to me, you know what, uh, there's loads of wool down here and the sheep are just throwing it away. And, you know, we did a little bit of research on it and we realized that, you know, wool is a very valuable commodity and it's an excellent uh, material for insulating. So what we decided to do was to set up a company to manufacture insulation from sheep's wool. Now, about eight years later, we sold that to uh, investors in the UK. We stayed with them for a little while. And our goal was to be the world's leading natural insulation company. So we built a factory in Wales, and you know we were driving around in fancy cars for a little while. And you know, after a while, something began to dawn on me that this wasn't really the path that I wanted to be on. So we parted company, and in 2009, I found myself unemployed and not really sure, at a crossroads, you could even say, um, not really sure what the next thing was. So I went back to college, I retrained, I became a kind of an energy engineer, and then a couple of years later, I was down in Kerry, and I did this course in hemp building. Now, I was amazed to find that I just drove down this kind of road in the middle of nowhere, and like I was on the side of a mountain. I, I didn't know what to expect, to be honest. Um, and the last bit of the road was only partly paved. And I got up there, and I said, like, I mean, even in the right place. But in there, I found people from Singapore, from Longford, from <laughs> Dublin, from the USA, there was a number of people from Poland. And at the center of it was an English guy named Steve Allen. And he's been living in Ireland for 30 years. And he's a pioneer of hemp building. And he's wrote a couple of books. And from that remote Kerry hillside, he has inspired what you might call a movement, um, or I don't know, something, an event a happening. But it's an awakening of interest in building with hemp. And you know. When I delved into it a little bit more, I found that you know, he wasn't even the first. He was, 
He had taken up the baton from people in France who had developed this idea as a way of conserving old buildings. And a few years later, I found myself doing a PhD. And in my PhD now, I'm trying to standardize this stuff. Because you can imagine that with any new technology that emerges where you have people from all walks of life who are trying to, um, how would you say, make something happen but for themselves. It's very difficult then to kind of get that to penetrate to a larger group of people. Um, you need to be a specialist to do it and all this kind of thing. But I think that this is such an opportunity. I mean, this material can help us to save so much energy, so many carbon emissions. All the plastic houses I showed you earlier, you can imagine what they're made of. They're made of petrochemicals, and they're made of concrete, which is a very high pollutant. So I had to learn one little lesson from all of the work that I had done up to that point in time. I had to absorb it. I had tried to be a leader in my field, and I found myself on a path that I wasn't really comfortable with. I had to step back from that path and look at life from a different perspective. The perspective where you come along and you build on what other people have pioneered and you try and add a little bit to it. And then hopefully you create a set of guidelines or a little bit of information or a little bit of help that somebody else can come along and take and run and build their own home and grow their own home. In summary, what I want to say to you is, what I learned about leading is that first, you have to learn how to follow. Thank you.